Hi everyone, in this week we're going to have a look at how we can respond to and handle exceptions that may arise from running our code. And we're going to have a look at a number of different approaches for responding to and handling exceptions. We're going to start by having a look at the try and catch clauses, where we try executing a piece of code and that may or may not throw an exception and if it does throw an exception we can then catch that exception and handle it safely to prevent the program from crashing and then we're going to go on to have a look at how we can organize this exception handling code into specific classes so that we can then create objects of this class and then throw objects of that class to then be caught and then provide specific messages which are relevant to the exception, the problem that has occurred. And then finally, we're going to finish the presentation by having a look at assertions, which uh, in C++ are built as a preprocessor macro, which can be used to evaluate a condition. And if that condition is false, then the assertion will terminate the execution of the program before it has a chance to crash. And then, of course, we can output a specific message to uh, explain why we are terminating the program. Okay, so let's start by first defining what an exception actually is. An exception is an event that occurs during the life of a program that could cause that program to act unreliably or even crash. So sometimes the user might make a mistake, such as entering the data in the wrong format or attempting to access an array element which doesn't exist. And that's what we mean by the term exception, an exception to the rule, an exception to the norm, okay, something that wasn't anticipated or expected. And it's these types of exceptions that may cause problems for the program if it doesn't know how to safely handle it. So therefore, we have to almost provide an insurance mechanism. We have to code into our programs a way of handling some of these mistakes or exceptions that may arise when a user is uh, using the program. And that's the key here. We want to try and write code that will handle exceptions safely so that the program doesn't crash and cause problems further downstream. And a common methodology to handling exceptions is to separate the code that detects the error from the code that handles it. And so we're going to have a look at a mechanism which will provide the ability to first define exceptions and then to instantiate exceptions and then to create blocks to detect and then handle the exceptions. Okay, so now let's have a look at the try and catch clauses. And so starting with the try block, that's where we place the code which we think might generate an exception. Remember we said that we want to separate the detection of an exception to the code which handles it. So the try block is the possible detection of an exception and then if we do detect an exception and we throw an exception, either implicitly or explicitly, we can then handle that exception in the catch block. So the try block corresponds with the detection of the exception and then the catch block corresponds with the handling of that exception. And so when exceptions are thrown within the try block, that's when we pass the control to the handlers, which are the different catch clauses. So these catch clauses are known as the handlers, and we can declare multiple catch clauses for a try block. But of course, if no exceptions arise from the code, which was tried, which was tested, then the handlers, these catch blocks, are ignored. Uh, we just move past them and then progress with the rest of the code. But if an exception is thrown, the control of the program then passes to a corresponding catch clause, which can handle that exception. That's where the control of the program goes to.
okay and uh, the stipulation is that the handlers have to be defined immediately after the try blocks it's possible to have multiple catch clauses which we'll see in a moment um, but they must be defined after the try blocks so that they correspond with the try block so let's have a look at the syntax for setting up a try and catch block. So starting with the try block, as you can see, it is the keyword try, followed by a pair of braces. And then within those pair of braces, uh, we put the code which we want to test to see whether that will generate an exception or not. So remember, this is the first part where we want to detect whether an exception is going to be generated or not. If it doesn't, then we ignore the handler, which is the catch block. As you can see here, we've only got one. But if it does generate an exception, then we uh, then pass control to the handler. So as we said, we've only got one handler in this example, which actually, after the keyword catch, is a pair of parentheses. And within those brackets, we've got an ellipsis, uh, three dots. Okay, and this is a mechanism to catch any exception of any type or description. Later, we're going to have a look at setting up multiple catch clauses where we can be specific and state which type of exceptions that we want to then respond to in a different way. But here, we've just got a catch all clause. And then within those braces, we specify the exception handling code, whether that's outputting a message or calling a method or doing something else to respond to the exception. And uh, if it's the case that an exception is raised within the try block, but no suitable catch block has been defined, then execution actually passes to the terminate function within the standard library, which is a way to safely terminate the program rather than just uh, crashing the program. And if it so happens that you want to test the entirety of a function for whether it generates an exception or not, you can actually declare the try and catch blocks as a replacement for the braces of a function. So you'll notice here that where you might have expected to specify a pair of braces for the function, and then within that function, set up the try and catch blocks, which also have braces, you notice here that we don't have braces for the function, which at the top there is the return type and then the identifier, the function name. Instead, we can just set up the try block and braces, and then underneath that have a catch block or multiple catch blocks uh, to represent the testing of that function. Okay, so now that we've had a look at the outline for the try and catch blocks, let's now have a look at how we can explicitly create and throw an exception. Now, this might be for testing purposes, where we just want to test whether the catch block can catch an exception being thrown, or we may even hard code a condition to be met. And if a condition isn't met, if it evaluates to false, then we throw an exception to manually state that an exception has happened, and then we want it to be caught by the catch clause. So to explicitly throw an exception, we can use the throw keyword here, and uh, the throw keyword accepts one parameter. So this could be a literal value, which may play a part in form of an error number, or even a particular value that has caused the exception that could then be printed to screen so that the user knows uh, what has caused the exception. So you can reuse the uh, problem values, if you like, to then put them back to the screen so the user knows what they are. Or they could even be specific messages, such as uh, a string literal, which describes the error or the exception, so that the user can know what's caused it. And uh, you can also throw uh, user-defined types as well, so you're not limited to just primitive uh, values and types. And you can do this by invoking the constructor of this user-defined type. So this isn't actually uh, 
passing the name of the class, I suppose you could say this is creating an anonymous object because when we call the constructor, we do set uh, values for data members within the constructor. And if it's a non-default constructor as well, we pass values to those data members to then set them. So I suppose you could say this is a, an anonymous object. Uh, we don't have an identifier for it, but as long as we have a catch clause set up to catch objects of that type, that class, then uh, we can then match the anonymous object to that uh, appropriate catch clause. Or indeed, we can actually create an object, uh, an explicit object. In this case, it's a static object in the third uh, green box here, and then uh, throw that object. So that might be useful if that object contains uh, erroneous data, or indeed uh, other parts of that object require changing uh, because they have thrown an exception. We then can pass that specific object, which is problematic, and uh, then respond to it it with an appropriate uh, action or message. And uh, that specific object may well be created anyway throughout the course of the program. So we don't have to uh, set another one up in order to be able to throw it. We can just throw the one which has already been created. Okay, so throwing an exception has both the benefit of actually explicitly declaring that an exception has happened, and it also has the benefit of being able to pass specific information referring to the exception that's going to be useful to the user when it's output to the screen and uh, give the user some direction or uh, throw the object itself which has uh, caused the exception or one of the values of the data members within the the object has caused the exception and uh, requires modification. And then we can set up corresponding catch clauses to catch certain types of exception. And it's worth saying that each catch clause can only catch one type of exception. So we can't have multiple types within the same catch clause. But what we can do is we can chain these catch clauses. So for every try block, we can have multiple catch clauses which will respond to one type of exception so that uh, when a particular type of exception is thrown, the corresponding catch clause, the handler, can then be invoked so that we can then see a specific response, whether that's outputting a uh, particular error message or providing a specific direction to the user or indeed calling a function uh, based on that exception which is really important because we're likely to encounter more than one problem, more than one exception throughout the lifetime of our code. And even a few lines in a block of code can generate multiple types of exceptions, uh, from formatting to errors with the inputs to wrong file types, uh, wrong locations, etc. So basically, this allows us to provide different responses to different types of exceptions that may be generated. We just have to match the type of exception that is thrown in the try block to the corresponding arguments within the parameters of the catch clause. And then even with multiple catch clauses, which each provide specific responses to a particular exception, we can still also have a catch all exception. If you remember, that uses the uh, three dots, the ellipsis at the bottom, which essentially acts like an else statement. So if it's none of the above, then run this one as the last resort, as the default to catch a generic type of exception, which will help catch any other types of exception that may be generated that we haven't anticipated um, from our try block. And then we can provide a generic response, um, as unfortunately we probably won't know what type of exception it is, otherwise we would have accounted for it in the specific uh, catch clauses. And okay, let's uh, put this all together now and have a look at an example. So if we have a look here, we've got a try block which asks us to type in the size of an array. 
And if the size of this array happens to be less than one, then we can throw the literal integer one, which if we have a look down to the catch clause, it's the second one where it's got a corresponding integer argument. That's actually going to be passed as a parameter into that argument, the value of one, so that we can then output that to screen, just so we know what's caused the exception. And if we go back to the try block now, and if we have a look at the second half of the try block, and of course, to get to the second half of the try block, we would have to first pass that first if statement. So the size would have to be greater than one in order to be able to progress on to the second half of the try block. Because of course, remember, if the exception is thrown, the uh, control of the program is passed to the handler, which is the catch block. We jump down to that. So assuming that the size checks out of a greater than one, we can then use that size to create an array, which is the character array there, new char array. And uh, the next test is not the size of the array, but whether we can actually create and instantiate the array based on that size of elements. So this would test to see that we can actually create the array and we've not run out of space. So if the buffer has the value of zero, i.e. it's not been instantiated, we can throw an out of memory string literal, which then passes the control to the catch handler, uh, which in this case is char pointer, because remember string is uh, an array of characters. So that then passes that message to that pointer so that we can then print that message out to the screen. So those are our two specific exception handlers there. We've got the uh, size of the array and the memory test. And then if in case another exception is thrown that we weren't anticipating, then we've also got a catch all handler right at the bottom. Remember that acts as the else statement. So if we have an exception that is different to all of the above, then we can default to this one, which just prints out a generic message of exception. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. Uh, that's just an example of where we could use some specific exception handling code and also provide a catch-all response to a typical requirement of setting up an array in our code. And just before we go on to have a look at exception classes, we've got a note here regarding the syntax of using the throw keyword with regards to our function signatures. Okay, so we can actually state the throw keyword after the function signature, the return type and the name of the function. And we can also specify the types of exceptions that can be thrown as parameters after that throw keyword. And then this can actually limit the exceptions which will be thrown to the specified types. So if we don't specify any types within the throw keyword parameters uh, after the function name, the program may well compile, uh, but it won't be able to execute correctly, especially if a, a exception occurs through that function. Therefore, the types that we specify within the throw keyword allow us to have more control over the types of exceptions which can be thrown or not. And so actually omitting that throw keyword and not uh, specifying what types of exceptions can be thrown, uh, this then removes those restrictions as to which uh, exceptions can be thrown or not. And all of the catch clauses that are specified within that function uh, can actually be executed. And the equivalent of this, if we want to specify the throw keyword within the, uh, the function signature after the function name, would be to include the ellipsis, the three dots in the parameters of the throw keyword. Okay, so uh, like most things with C++, we can be really specific in what we state explicitly uh, in terms of what we allow and what we don't allow uh, when we come to throw exceptions within any given function function.
And if you do decide to write the keyword fro explicitly within your function signature, uh, just remember that uh, this is not going to be checked at compile time. Okay, so you just remember that you have to state this correctly because it's not going to be managed uh, by the compiler. So with that said, let's now go on and have a look at how we can arrange our exception handling code into classes. And what we can do is we can actually inherit from the exception class itself. So let's take a look at that now. Like Java, C++ has its own exception hierarchy. And even though that the names of the classes in the Java exception hierarchy may differ to the names of the classes in the C++ exception hierarchy, the principle is the same, where there is an exception class that acts as the base class, the parent class, and then has a number of derived and specialized classes, uh, the children classes, which specialize in providing information for a specific error such as in the C++ hierarchy, the children classes of the exception class are classes like runtime error or bad alloc or logic error or bad cast. And even though we're not going to have a look at those particular classes uh, in this lecture, what we will do is we'll set up our own exception class so we get a chance to create our own class uh, specific to our program so that we can then inherit from the exception base class, parent class, and then then override its key member function, which is what. Uh, that's the member function that we're going to override to provide a specific message uh, for our type of exception that we're setting up a class to manage. And so if we want to set up our own exception class to then inherit from the base exception class, which, by the way, is located in the standard library, uh, we'd actually need to include the exception header. So in the next slides, you'll see the include preprocessor directive and the exception header there to get access to this exception base class. And then if you have a look at the blue box here, we actually see the implementation of an overridden form of the what uh, function, which is first defined within the exception parent class. And in this uh, example here, we've created our own exception class called my exception. And then we've got the public inheritance of exception, as you see there in the class definition. This function, uh, the what member function of the exception, exception parent class is what we want to override. So remember, we need to define this within our uh, exception class. So it has the signature of virtual constant char pointer and then uh, the member function name is what, and then it has a constant throw specifier at the end there. Okay, so it's expecting to throw uh, something within it. So remember, we looked at that uh, in the previous slide. And, um, and all it does is just return a message. So what we want to do is we want to provide a specific message in the form of a char array. So we're going to re return a pointer to a char array. That's why we our return type is char pointer. It's going to be a constant char pointer as well. Uh, we don't want to change it and we don't want to change the object uh, that's invoking this member function either. So we've made it constant. We want to just write a message that's specific to the exception that's happened so that we can then return that and then print it to screen. Okay, so let's take a look at an example of this on the next slide. And you'll notice here that we've defined our own IO exception class in the blue box, which I assume stands for input output exception, something to do with uh, a type of exception that may occur when attempting to input data or output data, presumably something to do with the formatting of that. Uh, but importantly, note that we are inheriting publicly from the parent class exception, the base class there, which resides within the 
exception header of the standard library. So notice at the top there underneath include IO stream, we've got an include statement uh, for the exception header there uh, to give us access to this exception class. And then note within the uh, public interface of this IO exception class, uh, we've overridden the what member function of exception. And uh, there we are returning a specific message uh, to this type of exception. And there we return the message controller error. So this message can be uh, displayed on the screen uh, when we invoke this what member function, the overridden version of it, when we catch and handle uh, an exception that's thrown of this type of class. Okay, so let's come down to the main now, where notice that we create an object of IO exception uh, called EIO. And uh, within the try block, uh, which is keeping things really simple for now, uh, we're just throwing the EIO object and then catch it with an appropriate handler there. And notice the catch block underneath the try block, which uh, actually takes a reference to a IO exception object called E. So this is a way of avoiding copying into a brand new object. Uh, we're actually looking for a reference, a memory address of type IO exception. So we can just refer directly to the object, which was already created and uh, then through that parameter e we just call the what member function which uh, of course prints out that uh, specific message the customized message of controller error okay for this type of exception and here in this slide we've got another example of creating our own exception class. Uh, this time it's called memory exception, but it still publicly inherits from exception. And uh, we override the what member function uh, to specify a particular message that is related to our exception. In this case, uh, out of memory, which is going to be returned should this function be called. And if we go to main here, We've got uh, a more comprehensive uh, block of code here for testing whether a array has been created of an appropriate size or not. So here we're asked to enter in the array size that's uh, input into the size uh, variable. And then that is then in turn used to create a char array. And if there's enough memory to create this array, then the buffer will have a value other than zero. Uh, but uh, if there isn't enough memory to create this uh, array, then buffer will still have the value of zero. So therefore, we can then throw a memory exception. And uh, here, what we're doing is we're actually calling the constructor of memory exception, where here we don't actually see the explicit version of that uh, constructor being defined. So regardless though, uh, we'll call the implicit version of the uh, constructor. And uh, what it will do here is throw an anonymous object because we're not giving it an identifier. We haven't uh, created an object of the memory exception class. Uh, with any kind of object name. So this is going to be thrown as an anonymous uh, object, but it can then be caught by a corresponding catch block. And uh, here you'll see that. And uh, interestingly, we haven't, uh, we're not ca we're not going to pass a reference to this anonymous object in this case. Um, perhaps we probably should, that might save on uh, the copy overhead there. Um, here it's probably just going to be passed by value, uh, so it'll create a copy of it, but uh, it might be more efficient to set up a reference as a parameter so that we can refer to the original address of this anonymous object rather than create a copy of it locally in this uh, catch block here. But regardless, we still call the what member function and we refer to the overridden version, of course, uh, which prints out out of memory. OK, so here in this next slide, we've kept with the same example and uh, the same code for the most part. But rather than throwing an anonymous object of the memory exception class, if our buffer cannot be created, our, our char array, what we're doing here is we're actually creating an object, a named object called ME, uh, static object, of course, uh, of the memory exception class. And then we're throwing that 
Okay, so that's just the alternative uh, mode where perhaps, again, if we were to expand upon this code here and we actually refer to the named object, this may be useful to then throw that in case there's a specific problem with this object rather than uh, creating an anonymous object on the fly and then throwing that, okay, which may not hold the same data as the uh, defined object. So it just depends on your scenario and whether you're working with specific objects or uh, if you're not, you can probably get away with throwing an anonymous object, you're not working with one directly. But uh, same principle applies here. We throw it to the handler, we catch it, and we call the uh, what member function, uh, the overridden version, which just prints out an appropriate message. All right, so that's just a alternate format for achieving the same outcome. And uh, if we have a look at this slide here, we've got uh, a similar example where we're creating an object, a static object of the my exception class. This is a user defined class, but notice there in main that we're actually passing a value to the non-default constructor. And if you remember, we said that throwing an exception has the dual purpose of, uh, first of all, detecting a problem and raising that. And then we can pass specific information like an error number or a problematic value. So that can then be printed to screen. And that's exactly what's happening here because we are passing the literal value of 100 into the non-default constructor and then assigning it to the data member called data. And uh, then we can refer to that uh, data member called data when we throw an exception of that class, which here in the main, we are throwing ex, the object uh, name. And uh, if you have a look at the catch block, we can both call the what member function, which prints out the message, and then refer to the data member called data through the E, uh, object or in this case it's a reference isn't it so we've gone back to using references again here which is good we can avoid the copy overhead but of course this uh, allows us to refer to other information that might be relevant for the user to know Okay, so I hope you're seeing here that uh, creating our own exception classes can be very useful for A, organizing our exception handling code better, but also allowing for more specific information that can be hopefully helpful to the user. And it may also be necessary to refrow an exception. Uh, or in other words, throwing an exception again once it's been caught the first time. If you have a look at the green box here, notice that we are throwing an exception within the try block, and then we are catching it in the uh, block underneath the handler, and then we're throwing that exception again. And notice here that we're just using the keyword throw. Uh, we can assume that the compiler knows that we are throwing an exception of the same type that was caught the first time. However, it may also be necessary to throw another exception uh, if something else goes wrong within this catch clause. Um, but if we are likely to encounter the same problem again, perhaps we are trying to validate the same user entry and they make the same mistake again, then we can throw the same exception and uh, that will throw another exception of the same type. OK, um, but of course, as we are throwing an exception, we also need to catch it somewhere else as well. And uh, whilst we chain the catch clauses for uh, the first try block, uh, we wouldn't be able to write the same catch clause underneath this first catch clause. Uh, because they are of the, the same type. So as these catch clauses are all overloads, we can't have two parameter lists which are the same. The compiler won't allow that. They have to be unique and uh, different from each other. So therefore, it's common to see the catch clauses for the refrow outside of this initial block typically the level up. So if this first try and catch block is contained within a function, then it's typically where this function is called uh, that we would then place that function call uh, within a try and catch block. Okay, let's have a look at an example of this. Uh, we will see this method illustrated.
And uh, if you have a look here on this slide, notice here that we have a function, a member function of this class, another exception example, uh, which is called do something. And this do something function does actually throw an exception. Uh, which is an object of the general exception uh, class. And uh, this is then caught underneath uh, a reference to that object. And then we call the what member function of the child class, the uh, specific class, general exception, printing out a message, presumably. And uh, notice down underneath that we throw again. We've got another throw keyword. And notice there that we don't need to specify an identifier after the throw keyword uh, because we're throwing the same exception again. But if you have a look down to the controller function underneath, notice there in that try block, we actually call the function do something. And hence, it's the catch block underneath that. That is where the second uh, thrown exception is caught. And notice that also has the same parameter as the first catch block. And indeed, we call the what member function again, printing out a message. So this is all about the design and the placement of uh, your try and catch clauses. And uh, just before we move on, one detail that we overlooked earlier was the uh, use of the keyword throw within the function signature for the do something function. Uh, if you remember earlier in the presentation, we had a look at uh, some different examples of writing the keyword throw. Uh, within the function signature. And this example here is a good illustration uh, because this function is actually throwing an exception. Okay, so this is just a way of explicitly stating that we expect to throw an exception of this type from this function, not just within it, but from this function. And uh, this is also useful for high level descriptions and uh, documentation as well, where we can state uh, that we expect these member functions to be throwing an exception. We may want to think a bit more carefully about the design of these functions too, because notice here that we've got the same catch clause in both the do something function and the controller function. Now, we said that the uh, catch clause for the controller was to catch the thrown exception from the do something function, but what we could do is we could separate the code which throws the exceptions from the code which catches them. Rather than repeating the same catch blocks in most functions, if we're going to be catching them from other functions, we could actually locate all of the catch clauses within a central function, such as controller in this case, and therefore we could remove the catch clause from the do something and instead just throw the exception so that it can be caught within the controller. And if it needs to be rethrown, then we can just call the function again and uh, repeat that process. Okay, so rather than having lots of functions which have both the try and catch clauses uh, within them, you may want to separate the two so that you have one function that contains the handlers, the catch clauses, and then your functions, which will throw the particular exceptions based upon uh, what's happening. Okay, so it's just worth thinking through the design and how you can be as efficient as possible when implementing exception handling within your classes. But let's now go on and have a look at assertions to finish this presentation. And whilst the exception handling code that we've seen so far in terms of try and catch blocks tend to operate at runtime, assertions, on the other hand, operate at compile time. And even so before compile time as well, because they're built as preprocessor macros. If you remember, we had a look at preprocessor directives uh, in the first week, looking at where we can set up macros to run certain blocks of code or not. And the assertions in C++ are built as equivalent uh, preprocessor macros, where they can evaluate a given condition 
and that tends to be checking parameters as we're going to see and uh, it checks to see whether a condition evaluates to true or false and if it's true then the compilation of the program is allowed to continue and if it's false then the compilation and uh, subsequent execution of the program is terminated and the assertion in C++ will actually print a message to the screen with the uh, problematic value and explain why the assertion failed and also alongside the particular uh, code line number and the file at which the assert failed okay so the condition has to evaluate to an integer value which is anything other than zero and so we can make use of C++'s uh, assert uh, command by including the assert header as seen below and then that allows us to use the assert uh, function you could say the preprocessor macro and then within a pair of parentheses we would write the condition where we want to compare values and um, this would return a boolean so we can compare any number of primitive data types or even user defined types as long as the evaluation will return either true or false. So the assert can decide whether the program is allowed to continue compiling and uh, executing or whether it's to be stopped and uh, then a message shown to screen. And so once we have finished setting up all of the different assertions to check particular parameter values or array boundaries, uh, rather than actually deleting this code, the assert statements in every single function, it's far easier to actually just turn the assertion checking off by defining a macro uh, at the top of the particular file that includes assertions. Okay, so we can do that by defining ndebug. Uh, which stands for no debug. Okay, so it uh, saves us having to delete all of this assertion checking code because, of course, remember that these assertions are going to be checked pre compilation. Uh, they're not going to check values at runtime. So we wouldn't really need to include this code within the final uh, source code, the final executable of the program. And so rather than deleting them, it's uh, just easier to turn this. Uh, assertion checking ability off and then we can rely on our exception handling code the try and catch blocks to catch any uh, particular user runtime errors such as entering data in the wrong format or cannot find the file directory uh, etc okay so let's take a look at an example of this here in this slide, notice that we have defined the assert conditions within the first line of the member functions uh, of this particular class, which is game. And uh, they are just going to check the parameters passed against a condition. So in the constructor here, the uh, non-default constructor, which takes the max players parameter, we just want to check that we have more than one player in order to run the game. Okay, that makes sense. Presumably we can't run the game with zero players. And indeed, I've just seen the second line, we're trying to use that max players uh, parameter to inform the size of the array. So we need to have uh, more than one element. Uh, therefore, we need the value to be greater than one. Okay, so that's why we have the first assert statement there. And uh, in the get player member function here, which takes an index, we are checking to see that the index is greater than or equal to zero and indeed is less than the top uh, boundary, which is the maximum number of players, which was entered above. Okay, so again, these are just assert statements placed in the first line of the functions to check the parameters, check that they adhere to the particular logic of the uh, functions, okay? And if we have a look at this slide here, we see an example where the assertion has failed, okay? And this looks to be on the uh, first assertion check, which is referring to max players. Uh, obviously, the number of max players that we entered uh, wasn't greater than one. Therefore, we have this statement here to say that uh, this assertion failed. 
and remember that if any of the assertions fail, then that will actually terminate the program. So we're not able to continue with the program as this first assertion fails. So the array wouldn't be set up correctly and therefore we wouldn't be able to input uh, data into the array uh, correctly either. So it's important that we stop in the program uh, before even more problems uh, may happen. And uh, we didn't mention it in the previous slide, but uh, in the main function, that's where we attempted to create the game with one player. Okay, so obviously but we need more than one. We need two as a minimum. So therefore, that's why this uh, assertion has failed. And if you have a look at the output, again, you'll see the file directory for the given file and indeed the line number as well. Okay, so it's, it's really helpful for testing um, any type of problems that may occur pre-compilation. And uh, this, it would be a good practice to use in combination with exception handling for then catching any user entered uh, anomalies or exceptions or problematic values. Okay, so that's just a little walk through assertions and that does bring us to the end of the presentation. So let's now transition into having a look at some of the exercises for this week. Great, so let's dive into the first exercise for this week. And we're gonna start by setting up a class we've been given the code here for a weapon class, which has a throw command there. It's going to throw a literal uh, if the number of rounds is less than one. So for the rounds of bullets or ammunition, uh, if we have less than one uh, bullet in the round, then we are going to not allow our weapon to fire. All right, so that's a little bit of exception handling that we've uh, been given. And so let's copy this. And then in our project, let's add a class for weapon. So just going to create it like we usually would. And in fact, I think we can replace most of this template code given to us with the code that we are provided for the weapon class here. Yeah, so we've got our uh, iStream namespace, and then we've got the private interface and the public interface, and there we go. Okay, so let's move down now. And we're told to create a static instance of weapon within main and invoke its fire member function. Okay, and when we run the application, it should throw a exception uh, because it is throwing one here. Uh, and presumably we haven't instantiated the rounds or, or actually when we call the instructor, we set the rounds to zero, um, which is less than one. So therefore that's why it will throw the exception. All right, so let's uh, save this here and set up the static instance. So I want to include our weapon there. And actually, let's put this at the top. Put some down there. Okay. And uh, within our main, let's say weapon. And then let's just create a static instance. And then if we attempt to invoke the fire command and run this, we should be halted and shown an exception message. So we're attempting to run the program and here we go. Exception's been thrown, it's unhandled, therefore it's going to pause the execution of the program and ask what we want to do. We can choose to uh, terminate it by um, stopping the debug here. Uh, I think if we attempt to continue, it's probably going to be frozen. Um, so let's just stop it, finish the execution. And then now let's go back and handle this error. Okay, so there we go. We've got the explanation there. And we are told to set up a try and catch block within the main and output a message to say that we had an error and uh, this is the particular number that was uh, that had caused uh, the problem. The uh, number of rounds was less than one, therefore this is why the error is being thrown. So let's, uh, now, let's now create a try and catch block here. And so I want to encase the fire command 
which is being called through the particular static instance here in a try block. And then I want to set up a catch block. And I could type the ellipsis here to catch all catch all of the exceptions that are being thrown, but it's probably good practice to save that for the end. Because I know that I'm throwing a literal value, it's an integer here, I should be able to catch exceptions that are a type integer. So within the uh, brackets here, if I set up an integer so that all of the integer exceptions, problems with integers, are caught by this particular catch block. And then it's within here that I just want to output this message um, error. Error, and we could say, I mean, in this case, we know it's because it's less than one, but uh, let's just keep things simple and just output this uh, value here. Because remember, it's going to pass it as a parameter. So number one is going to be passed here into E. So therefore, I can print E to screen the value of one here. Okay. So if we run it again now, we should see hopefully this message. And there we go. Yeah. And uh, notice we didn't crash the program. We kept executing the program. We allowed it to continue. So we've prevented a serious crash and instead just seen a message. Okay, that's good. All right, so let's keep moving here. Let's look at the next exercise, which I think is to do with referring to the base exception class. Remember, we had a look at this in the presentation. We can set up a series of derived classes, children classes, to inherit uh, from this class and also override the key member function, which is what. And it uh, looks as if we're going to set up a derived class here. Uh, so let's set that up. We've been given the code, which is going to override the member function. So let's add it in. Let's uh, write here that we want to inherit from the exception base class. We're also going to have to include a reference to this class. Uh, remember, we need to uh, include that here. It's defined within the exception header of the namespace, uh, the standard namespace. So we need to include both of those. So we can write exception in the base class category there. So let's do that. And uh, let's add in the references here. We need to include the reference to exception. And we also need to uh, use the standard namespace as well. So let's uh, write that. There we go. Yeah, and in fact, in fact, we could just copy most of this. So let's, uh, let's do that. Let's copy this into here because it should, or, should already be set up for us. There we go. We are overriding the what data member just to show a specific message, uh, which is insufficient ammunition uh, because it's a no ammo exception. Exceptions being thrown because not enough ammo, in this case, no ammo uh, has been allocated. All right, so now we have to go back to where we previously threw the literal one in our weapon class. There we go. And we want to now set up a private data member of this uh, weapon no ammo exception. So we probably need to include a reference to that. Let's uh, include this here. No ammo exception. The header file to that. There we go. And now we should be able to throw, rather than one, we should be able to throw our object, which is e no ammo, uh, instead of one. Okay, we're going to throw that object, so that can then be caught by a corresponding catch block. So it's no longer of type integer, it's now going to be of this custom user-defined type, uh, which is no ammo exception. So. Uh, oh, we're actually going to have to include a reference to it here as well. <laughs> Lots of references. So let's uh, put that in here. A e no exception, just so that we can uh, catch it. No ammo exception. And uh, let's set up a reference here, just so we don't have too much copying going on. We want to reduce the copy overhead. 
so all we should need to do here is just call the what member function because that returns the uh, message that we want to print to the screen. So if we run this now, hopefully we'll see the specific message that we intended to print. There we go, insufficient ammunition. Yes, yeah, so we get a more uh, particular message for this particular type of exception. There we go. So hopefully this is making sense so far. That was uh, exercise two there. Okay, so hopefully um, you should get on fairly well with that. And um, that hopefully should get you started then. Uh, I think the rest of the exercises ask you to create your own uh, specific uh, exception classes. I think this looks like one here, magazine full exception. So presumably when you exceed the uh, number of rounds, uh, that's where you want to throw that exception. We've got jammed exception. There's lots of other user-defined exception classes. So hopefully you should be able to uh, have a go at the rest of those exercises. And uh, maybe just to finish off here, the final exercise, exercise seven, uh, asks you to use the assert statement. So let's just uh, model that before we uh, finish up here. So exercise seven, uh, we're asked to modify the weapons constructor to accept the initial number of rounds and through an assert statement within the constructor ensure that this is between zero and 10. All right, okay, so I think we're gonna to have to create a non-default constructor within our weapon. Uh, so let's do that. And that takes in the number of rounds. And then we're going to want to test that. Uh, remember, that's what the assert statement is used for. It's used to test whether the parameters are logically correct within the context of the program. So let's uh, include a reference so that we can uh, call this assert statement. Uh, I'm going to need to include the assert header file so that we can call the assert function now within our non-default constructor. And we want to test whether the uh, rounds parameter is uh, greater than or equal to zero because it's inclusive. So it'll have to be zero or more. And whether rounds is less than or equal to 10. Yeah, so it can include 10 as well in that. So uh, if that is false, if that assertion, if that condition evaluates to false, then the assertion is going to be generated and it's going to stop the execution of the program. All right, we'll see the message on the screen. But uh, if it does check out, then we can then assign it. So let's assign the parameter rounds to the uh, data member rounds. All right, so I'll tell you what, let's uh, test this now. Uh, if we um, call the non-default constructor, and I'll tell you what, let's pass it minus one. So we should fail the assertion. Let's see if we see the uh, message now. Ah, yes, and here we go. Uh, we see that the uh, assertion has been generated. It tells us that uh, uh, the rounds is not uh, greater than or equal to zero or less than or equal to 10. Uh, it's line 17 of weapon.h. Okay, so it's quite quite descriptive. Uh, tells us a lot of information. Uh, let's just ignore this and then uh, close it. All right, and just to check, let's give it a legal value, seven. Let's just check that it allows us to proceed with the rest of the program. Yeah, and there we go, we fire the weapon. Great. Okay, yeah, so I hope that makes sense. Uh, have a go maybe at using a cert in some of the other uh, functions which use parameters. That could be a good test uh, just so you get used to writing it yourself. Uh, but I hope that's enough to get you started. Uh, have a go at the rest of the exercises and uh, see how you get on.